me read some ideas that I've spent uh, most of the winter working on. This is an especially potent day for me, for I'm once again on the campus where I began my teaching career five full decades ago. I find to my pleasure that Southwestern is still so as lively, vital, and young at heart as it was when I was here. My allergies are bothering me. <laughs> and now on this extraordinary day, I've just been inducted, or I'm about to be inducted into the Fine Arts Hall of Fame. I'm interpreting this event as a pat on the back for a life well lived in teaching and art. Thanks to all of you at Southwestern for the honor and for the strong sense of satisfaction and contentment that I feel right now. I'm so pleased I can share these, this special day with my talented wife, Marjorie, who has been with me every step of the way. And my son, is, Christopher, is here. He spent his first two years in Winfield, and when he was two, fell into some exposed gauging wire as Darbeth was being built. He was slightly bloodied, but he tells me he's fine now. <laughs> also, my nephew Tim Laveau is here. He drove from Mesa, Arizona to give me a handshake. Thanks, Tim. And to my astonishment, Christos Corvesis, class of 68, is here. It's wonderful to see you, Christos. It was a very fateful day when we met at the American Express office in Athens in 1963. Now I want to make some comments about being a young professor at Southwestern. And I've written them in the form of a letter. It goes like this. Dear Southwestern, Right now, at this moment, I'm having a powerful case of deja vu. It's very compelling. If I turned around quickly, I might see myself carrying a bucket of clay or a box of slides or be hanging an exhibit or advising a student, perhaps Steve Heckman, who used to call me coach. Actually, I'd probably be doing all of these things at the same time. <laughs> I'm generally spellbound for in these spaces, the campus, the classrooms and hallways, in this very auditorium, I once helped shape the ideas and influence the lives of Southwestern students whose intelligence and work ethic and creativity I grew to respect and admire. The opportunity to teach here began in the early in early June of 1958, when I accepted President Stroll's invitation to be interviewed for a teaching position that had just become open. <clears throat> My wife Marjorie and I had driven all night from the University of Colorado at Boulder and arrived mid-morning. We met with President Stroll and later had dinner with the chairman of the Fine Arts Department, Jack Jurgens, and his wife Louise. It's been a long, hot, humid day, and the sky was turning gray-green. We heard thunder in the distance, and it began to rain. With it, hail began to frost the grass. Cowley County toads were being flattened on the streets of Winfield. <laughs> then we learned a tornado was on the ground near El Dorado. I had just been told the best thing about Southwestern were its students, when above the loud drumming of hail on the carport roof, I heard myself with enthusiasm say, sign me up. <laughs> This was the dramatic beginning of nine deeply satisfying years of teaching and mentoring at this dynamic, spirited college. That summer and autumn, I began to discover the what, when, where, why, and how of the teaching profession, and slowly put together the crucial ideas necessary for instructing the many differing courses which were under the heading of ART. 
As I realized what a heavy and diverse course load I faced, I knew I needed a way to find commonality between all those courses. The central concept that I cooked up that would make manageable and illuminate and enrich every art course I would be teaching was this, art is language. Language, absolutely. But of course, it's a means of communicating that differs from most conventional languages, since its vocabulary and alphabet are made out of the expressive elements of light, line, color, texture, space, and form. My teaching mission became clear. I was to help my students become visually literate, and in addition, help them discover the creative potential of this marvelous and evocative language. From this, appropriate for liberal education, other benefits could occur, that is, Reading the language of art through the ages could cause my students to have a more vivid understanding of where they stood in human history. It would also make clear the important role that artists have in society and would help my artistically gifted students understand why and how they could express their experiences in visual terms. The students responded with enthusiasm to those goals. Let me mention some of them. Harriet Walker, Geraldine Miller, Brent Matson, Marcia Spear, Bill Todd, Mariana Waite, Tom Tupurzer, Zena Gore, Larry Jantz, Steve Heckman, Susan Finney, Doug Keller, David Malby, and there were many more. They were all the equal of any of those that I've taught elsewhere. So after I got my act and rhythm established, to my delight and satisfaction, I realized I was at the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. Though teaching about visual expression was very satisfying, it could be exhausting. For example, in addition to the history, theory, and lab courses I was teaching, I was also monitoring a kiln seven days a week, sometimes getting out of bed at 2 a.m. to turn it off. The wide range of art lab courses also meant that I should become skilled in lots of different media. I remember rummaging around in the ditches of the county roads in order to collect case, uh, clay samples. But to my surprise, the most useful clay type I found was located beneath the bleachers of the football stadium. <laughs> it's made me a little worried to see all this digging going on <laughs> under the football field. It was under the bleachers where the clay was located. The students and I dug it up and processed it, and together we learned how to make pottery from native clays, and we made beautiful tiles and mosaics as well. 